I guess class is in session. <laughs> um, for anybody who wasn't here last quarter, what's your name? You two, when I gave a previous presentation. Around this time last year, I gave a presentation on uh, the valve, like tips and tricks in Salmon Run in Splatoon 2, or in Splatoon 3. Um, I wanted to do that again. An opportunity arose when like a group of friends asked me to make a presentation. Um, and this was the topic I came up with. I thought you guys would appreciate it. <laughs> is a full research analysis on what is Little Buddy made out of? Because it's a question I think plagues the entirety of Splatoon 3, and I'm sure all of you are curious about it. Yes, I've thought about this every day of my life. So. Like, how does the goober go through so much of this stuff? <laughs> wow. So, let's do, let's talk some background about Little Buddy. Little Buddy is your companion in Splatoon 3. Some would say your best friend. Um, he helped save the world in Alterna in many different ways. He got lost as a child, according to Sunken Scroll 8, and to know he is still a child. Um, he's always hungry, also given by Sunken Scroll 8. His body does amazing things, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But all of these unique applications that, or yeah, things Little Buddy can do allow him to contribute to saving the world. And he can be found in the plaza hanging out in 10 locations, I think, per plaza. It's at least 10 in the Splatoon 1 plaza. Low frame rate is doing numbers on this. Whoa. So, what do we know about small fries as a species? We have to start with the broader topic here. They're small, they're fast, they're somewhat fragile. They only have 40 HP and are weak to uh, enemy ink. They deal 25 damage and they drop three power eggs when we kill them. Um, they typically travel in groups. They have moderate to low intelligence. Uh, they are capable of operating fly fish machinery, but that's presumably only the most advanced intelligent uh, small fries out there. And they are able to use cutlery, so at least they are capable of using tools. And then they rely on smell to locate targets. That's an interesting fact that I don't think everybody knows. And then they use their giant eyes to <laughs> their in vision. So there's a fly fish. Illegal thing. <laughs> Illegal thing. Kill it now. <laughs> So, unauthorized air <laughs> Let's talk about some of the incredible feats that Little Buddy can perform. He eats fuzz balls, which requires a lot of stretching to do. Like, his body gains so much volume there. Um, he has a strong digestive system, considering how fast he eviscerates <laughs> a fuzz ball. And he can do a lot of internal compression on these fuzz balls. He's also very squishy, highly elastic, so flat sometimes, can absorb impacts. This is why you can never really hurt him, even if you try, but still don't try to hurt him. Um, and also worth noting, he has gone to space. He is able to live without oxygen. He's resistant to low pressures um, and sustains all of his elastic properties at low temperatures and high temperatures, because uh, space can allow both. And something I feel like people don't talk about enough, he's able to fly for thousands of kilometers into space. As you go to space, he just follows along behind. And I don't know how he does that. <laughs> all the fuzz balls. Yeah, all the crazy transitions. Uh, so the objective of this PowerPoint is to figure out what he is made of. And some of the material properties that we have to analyze to determine what he's made out of include density, which we need to get size and mass, elasticity, and temperature dependence. And now, before going into the full PowerPoint presentation, I do want to make a few cautionary notes. This is not an experiment. I cannot go to Splatsville or Alterna, um, and it's unethical to test on children. It's also unethical to test, do material testing on people, because that requires a lot of stretching and compressing that would be very cruel and painful. Um, this is more of a literature review. Uh, we will not be following the scientific method, so if you're expecting a kind of like question, hypothesis, materials, format. I'm sorry, I can't really give that here. But um, also, a positive bit of this is no small fries were hurt during the production of this PowerPoint. Unharmed. Oh, I was chugging, or did I just did not? There we go. So, to start. We have to find the size of Little Buddy. And in order to find the size of Little Buddy, we need to find the size of some kind of reference. Now, 
Inklings were the thing that came to mind first for me because they appear in a lot of different ways and there are a lot of different ways to test their height. So I took it upon myself to test three different methods of measuring their height. The first is by comparing it to an NZAP, which if we take from real life, we know that any zapper that the NZAP is based off of is 30 centimeters long. And if you do some pixel measurements comparing the two lengths of an NZAP and an inkling, you end up with a measurement of around 0.6 meters, which is very, very short. Um, but worth noting also is this is prone to error, because we don't know if the NZAP from Splatoon is the same size as the ones in real life. They could be scaled up or down even. We don't know. What's so, that in American? What's that in American? <laughs> what is it called? Roughly like two feet. Well, 30 centimeters is a foot. So if it's 1.94 feet, it's, yeah, around two feet. Um, the next method I tested, which I think is the most reliable, is by using the kinematics of um, an inkling can jump its own height. And if you start at a standstill, which is at the apex of a jump, you can determine how far that falling is based on the time it takes to fall, if you know the acceleration. Um, and I did that math here, and it gave us a height of roughly uh, just a little bit over a meter, or three feet. Um, and then the last method is just one that's provided in the Splatoon. In Splatoon 1, in Second Scroll 5, it said the Scroll itself says that inklings can jump five feet, or 1.5 meters if you're in international versions, which is a roughly equal conversion, so not, um, not really fallible there. But something I think is worth noting there is we don't know if the feet or meters being used to measure inklings is the same as our feet. This goes into historical concepts of drifting of measurements over time. There's also different units of measurement that can have the same name. One notorious one is uh, the English inch and the uh, French inch, which is why Napoleon was reported to be really short when he was generally around average height, is because a French inch is longer than an English inch. And how do we know if an inkling meter is the same as a human meter? Or at least an imperial, not, not imperial, a metric meter. So that's also a little bit fallible too. I think using Earth gravity is the most reliable source and is also around the average of the rest. So we're gonna do a classic engineering move an approximate inkling site to be one meter. <laughs> that's what a lot of engineers do. If you take an average of something, find a good round value around there, that's what you assume the height is. Um, you could also make size comparisons in Mario Kart to people with known heights, but that was too hard. Well, it's not part of my methods here. Um, so if we compare an inkling site to middle body, you get measurements of 0.207 meters tall and 0.124 meters wide, which is about like eight, nine inches tall, I think. Um, and then if you calculate his volume, you get 0 0.00417 meters cubed, which will become relevant later. Do you assume he's a cylinder? Hmm? Would you calculate the volume? Uh, assume he's a cylinder. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so we're really doing a lot of engineering here. Yeah. You take his radius, <laughs> and then you square it, and then multiply it by his height. He's roughly cylindrical, honestly. Like, you need the shape. Squaring the circle, yo. Also, you only need a rough approximation here, because you're gonna, as you're gonna see, there's gonna be some drift from comparable values in real life. Anyway, now we're gonna do mass and density. Um, ignoring how he can fly, which implies that he could be lighter than air, um, we're gonna compare him to a burst bomb, which is the closest thing to a homogeneous known mass we have in Splatoon. Um, it's also a sphere, which is nice. Um, the composition of ink in Splatoon is highly debatable. Some people argue that it's like water-based, some people argue it's oil-based, it could be something else. Ink in real life also has a lot of variable properties, a lot of different types of ink. Um, but we're gonna treat it like water, generally speaking, because densities are relatively similar to water for most inks. Um, and if you throw a burst bomb and you throw a little buddy, they go about the same distance. Little buddy goes a little bit further, but as you will know, little buddy is much smaller than a burst bomb. So we can attribute that to air resistance. Um, if we make some assumptions, like if it's a perfectly round modulus blob, 100% full of ink for a burst bomb, and your throwing style results in the same force as if you would throw a little buddy, you can do all these measurements, get a volume for the burst bomb, that multiply by the density of water, or yeah, use the density of water, and then you get the burst bomb's total mass. And then it should be equal to little buddies if you're throwing with the same force, 
which you can back convert using volume and get a density of 9,000 kilograms <laughs> per meter cube, which, if you can notice, is nine times denser than water. <laughs> um, also worth noting, because Little Buddy is alive and likely, in order to eat stuff, has like uh, space inside him, it can be made of even denser materials, because this is assuming that he's made of one homogeneous blob of one single material. <laughs> the animations. Okay, we're gonna talk about his elasticity now. Oh and the best measurement of this, according to my simple engineering roommate, is the Young's modulus, which measures stress over strain. And it basically, to simplify it, is how much, how easy it is to compress him. Like, under how much pressure does he crumple, <laughs> I guess. It's how much he is able to squish down under a certain amount of force. Um, so if you test his strain, that is how much he squishes over a certain length, which if you throw him against the ground, it ends up being negative 0.63. And then if you do another kinematics equation of him hitting the ground, find the velocity that he hits the ground at, <laughs> you can get a speed of 4.7 meters per second. And then you can calculate for acceleration based on how much he squishes in that short amount of time, which will get you 4.6 meters per second squared. Um, convert that into force, and it's about 5 g's of force that he's sitting the ground at, which isn't a lot, honestly, but you know that 5 g's of force is a lot to feel, or it's uncomfortable, that's what I mean to say. Um, then if you assume he's a cylinder again, and find his cross-sectional area, um, you can do force over area, which will get you the Young's modulus, which is stress over strain, which will get you a value of 0.23 gigapascals, which doesn't really mean anything. We're gonna compare it to some other, uh, other materials later, so you can get a sense of what exactly that means. But the lower the value of the Young's modulus, the more squishy something is. Now we got temperature dependence. Um, he operates the same regardless of what temperature he is in, whether it be atmospheric, uh, whether it be like the highs of space or the lows of space, depending on if something is in the sun or the shade, it can either get above boiling at 120 degrees Celsius, or way below freezing at negative 160 degrees Celsius. Um, this means that he is highly thermally insulated. He may not contain water because it would freeze or boil away. Um, he also may have evolved from tardigrades, which are notoriously able to live in space for prolonged periods of time. So this is all very interesting. But, ooh, this one's a strong thing, but, but it's time to do a material comparison. Let's take the properties we just analyzed and compare it to some real life materials. First, let's talk about density. Density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cube, which we discussed earlier, um, and Little Buddy is around 9,000. Steel, for reference, is 7,800, and lead is 10,000. So he's more dense than steel, but less dense than lead, if you're assuming he's a single homogeneous blob of something which probably isn't, and is probably made of something on the denser side. Um, if you talk about his elasticity, he's in this weird area where not a lot exists. If you take like skin, it's a little bit more squishy than Little Buddy is, same with like rubber. Um, but if you compare it to like wood or thermoplastics, like plastic containers and things like that, those are a little bit more rigid than he is. Um, and concrete is way, way more dense. I don't think he's made of concrete. Um, and yeah, there's no strong match. And then if you talk about temperature dependence, he operates at a wide range of values. And rubber solidifies at like negative 70 degrees Celsius. Um, thermoplastics generally kind of break down around 80 to 100 degrees Celsius. Um, some can make it around there. So he could be made of thermoplastic. But metals are solid throughout this entire range and don't really change in properties that much over a wide range of temperatures. So, based on the density and the temperature, made of lead. <laughs> this is not a completely matched conclusion, considering his elasticity does not match at all, but this is the closest thing we have, is he's made of lead. But, if this, if this works, I don't know if it's gonna go through, there we go. There are a few little miscellaneous things that I do want to talk about here. Um, despite matching lead most in material properties, Little Buddy is alive. 
And as far as we know, there are not lead-based life forms. The general structure of his body must be flexible in some way, so if he is made of lead or some other heavy metal, um, he'll have to be made of a matrix that can bend appropriately, and it must allow biological functions to perform. So it's probably not carbon-based. He could be lead-based, like the first lead-based life form. We know that there are carbon-based life forms and silicon-based life forms. And if you look at a periodic table, if you continue down this chain, lead's right there. <laughs> Could be made of lead. Um, also worth noting is he has to be incredibly strong to eat fuzzballs. Um, but also since he went to space, he might not be reliant on oxygen for energy source. What exactly is he using as an energy source? I don't know. There are a lot of options for battery-based <laughs> compression. And also, he can sp spontaneously evolve into a creature of many times his size, and then devolve back with no problems, unexplained. So, in conclusion, I don't know why I'm doing this with remote desktop. Uh, in conclusion, I don't know what little buddies made out of it. <laughs> but there are so many competing factors, assumptions, and simplifications at play here that's hard to come to any conclusion. However, whether he may be made of rubber or lead, he is our friend. And we love him all the same. That's the important part. Uh, Any other sources that I need? <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> yes. Assuming, so given that, given that Splatoon is in a post-apocalyptic world where a lot of, like, you know, a lot of pollution is happening, do you think his properties could be attributed to eating tons of microplastics from life forms in the water? Potentially, if you're looking at it over an evolutionary time scale, not him individually, I think, because there were a lot of properties of like, even if he was just like a regular salmon that went to space, even if he ate a bunch of microplastics, I don't think that would save him. But if his ancestors had eaten microplastics and continued to pass it down to a point where it became a major part of his biology, given the microplastics have the right properties, maybe. But it doesn't really account for the extra density that he has, because plastic isn't very dense. So it would, if we're thinking post-apocalyptic, it could be a mix of like microplastics and like uranium, uranium. which is also very dense. Well, there is the possibility that you know the nuclear fallout that caused the flooding of the ocean. Yeah, the nuclear fallout that destroyed Mount Fuji in Splatoon. <laughs> How would you, you know that little buddy is what if he's just like an AI? Because we know that like Commander Tartar was like an AI that somehow goof and stuff like that. I don't know. I'm That's sure. true. There are biological like robots that exist in this world. That is a theory that would be worth pursuing further. I will <laughs> note this could be explained by something like nanobots. Micro machines. Nano machines? Yeah, nano machines. But yeah, that's something that absolutely should get more research done into it. Wow, okay, let's play Splatoon. <laughs>